Well, welcome. Happy New Year. Welcome in the name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. We come together to worship Almighty God, our triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit today. We've been called into his presence. He gives us this opportunity to take a moment away from our daily lives and to set this whole day apart for things that truly matter, things that we don't normally or often don't give thought to. What is it to be human, created in the image of God? What is it to be the redeemed of the Lord's people? Let us hear from God's word. I'm going to read to open our time, Matthew 10, verses 29 to 42. We jump into the parable of our Lord and Saviour, and it starts. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father's knowledge. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Whosoever, therefore, shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be, be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. He that receiveth you, receiveth me. And he that receiveth me, receiveth him that sent me. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet, shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man, shall re receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water, only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Hard words. God is not in the business of gently declaring what he requires of us. Jesus states, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. It says that Jesus didn't come to bring peace in the context of this passage, but he came to set a sword to divide and sadly, even as we were talking earlier on today, that includes families. But what a blessing it is when the Lord draws a, not just a, a physical family together, but then places those physical members of that family into the greater family of God. And then what peace we have. Let us come before the Lord and pray. Let us pray. Our gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we feel the pain of the words that have been read. We think about those that we know and love, those even within our own families who at this time 
do not know you. And the, the trouble that that brings within our relationships. They cannot see your worth. They cannot see your beauty. They are dead in their sins and their trespasses. They are at enmity with you by wicked works and even the thoughts of their minds. And Father, this truly grabs our heartstrings. As we look upon our family members whom we love so very dearly, who are heading towards hell, heading towards an eternity, separated from the love and goodness of God. And it pulls our hearts, Lord, as we consider them. The arguments, the... Lord, just our day-to-day -day interactions. Lord, we ask that you might have mercy upon them, that you would truly reveal to them the glory and wonder of Jesus Christ, whom we meet to worship this day. Also give us, by your Holy Spirit, the power and the strength to love our enemies, to do good to our enemies, to do good, Lord, to those who are enemies and yet within our own household. Give us the strength, Lord, to love you as we ought, with our whole heart, with our whole mind, with our whole life, holding nothing back from you, whether mother, father, son or daughter, that we might know the excellency and the beauty of worshipping you, as is your due. But keep our hearts still warm. Lord, let us not build up barriers within our minds, in our hearts and in our relationships with those who are outside of Christ at this time. Break us down, Lord, into prayerful people, in people who seek for their ultimate good, pleading with you, Lord, to give them a new heart, a new mind, a new life. As we enter into this new year, Lord, we would each declare and ask that this, this year would be set <coughs> apart. That this year we would grow more in our knowledge and love of who you are and the requirements from that into our own lives. As we look back upon the past year, we ponder and consider all of the victories that you have enabled us to witness and even to have achieved in our lives. And we rejoice. And yet we also look back and Lord, we know that Jesus Christ has not returned yet. That sin is still crouching at our door. Willing and desiring to master, master us. To cause us to walk away from you. Through the difficulties of life. Through our own heart's desires. And we ask Lord that 2019 would be a different sort of year. A year that we can each look back on. And see more victories than failures. That we might see your hand in our lives in its direction. See the love of God in our hearts. See the desire to fulfil the great commission of, 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 of presenting Jesus Christ to the world in our lives. 
even by the simplicity of a cup of cold water. Lord, we pray for opportunities to do good. We pray for opportunities to speak, to show forth the glory of Christ in this church and in our own personal lives. Lord, we ask that you would come. Be present with us, not just for this day, but the entirety of the year and the entirety of our lives. For we ask it to the glory of Christ and Lord, even for our own benefit, that we might know you and love you more in 2019. Hear and be pleased to answer our prayer. For we come not in our own merits, not boasting in our own works, but boasting in Christ Jesus, who loved us and gave himself for us. Amen. Let us turn into the hymn books and whether we can sing well or sing badly, let us at least raise our hearts to the living God in song and sing 794, trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey, 794. If you'd like to turn to the Word of God and we start appropriately in the first book, Genesis chapter 12. Genesis, the Greek word for beginning. As we come in the beginning of our new year, we come to the beginning of a story of Abraham. Genesis chapter 12. And that's to be found on page 11 of the back pew Bibles or page 16 of the large brown pew Bibles. While you're turning there, I want to just say, what did we just sing in verse 4 of that, that hymn? We sang, what he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. How easy those words come from our lips when we're singing. How difficult it is to do when we're doing, when we're living. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey think we need to be challenged by what we sing otherwise lies can be sung beautifully Genesis chapter 12 and it's a short reading today just verses 1 to 9 let us pray and ask for the Lord's blessing and understanding as we read our gracious Lord and heavenly father now as we approach your word Your word that you have set above us to guide, to show, to direct, to command, to give us examples, to show us how we ought to live in this life as your people. Father, we pray through the reading of your word that your Holy Spirit would attend to our ears and to our hearts and that we would be challenged this day. For a new beginning. Lord hear and answer. This prayer. To the glory of Christ. And the upbuilding of his church. Amen. Let us hear God's word together. Genesis 12. Verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram. Get thee out of thy country. And from thy kindred 
and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee. And curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him. And Abraham was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abraham passed through the land unto the place of Sychem, unto the place of Morah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and high on the east. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abraham journeyed, going on, still toward the south. This is God's word. This is God's word to us today. <coughs> Let us join together and sing about the God of Abraham. Um, in our reading here, God has not yet changed Abraham's name to Abraham, but they are the same people, and Sarai becomes Sarah. But they are the same, but God blesses them. And so let us sing of the God of Abraham. Hymn number 52, the God of Abraham prays. Number 52. Amen. The God of Abraham prays at whose supreme command from earth I rise and seek the joys at his right hand. I, all on earth forsake. It's wisdom, fame and power. And him my only portion make, my shield and tower. Today we find ourselves in the new year. The past is exactly that the past and the future unknown to us yet we often mark the turn of the year as a new beginning a, a time when we can put to one side all of the problems of the previous year we somehow demark it and, and say that's gone and now we look to the future we look back over the past year and we think of the things that have gone well and we rejoice. And then there are those things that we call New Year resolutions. And that's normally because we've looked down through the past year and we think that there are things that need to change in our life. We think if only things could be different. We make those resolutions. Sometimes we keep them and more often than not, we do not. But these are opportunities to reflect. God has said that he has set the, the stars and the moon and the sun as, as signs and, for signs and for seasons. There are seasons within our lives. And this is an opportunity to reflect. To look back. But also to look to the future. We're often told in the scriptures to set our eyes on the future. To seek God in the present that we might be transformed. To know more and more of who he is. His worth. And who we are. And what God requires of us. 
We're told in the scriptures to keep our eyes as Christians upon that blessed hope of the return of Jesus Christ back to this world to reign in righteousness, to vindicate his people, to vindicate God's word in the face and in, in, in and before the eyes of unbelievers. We're told to keep our minds set on that coming time where we will truly be changed. When no more New Year res resolutions will need to be made. When Jesus perfects us at his coming. But that time is not yet. So we walk in faith. Setting out upon a new year and a new beginning for that year. What should we be looking towards? What should we be expecting from the coming year? And today I would like us to consider a new beginning one that is motivated in and through faith and obedience to our triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And let our minds ponder on what it means to follow God as we journey on. Let's turn back to the passage we have read and think what it meant for Abraham or Abram to start out on his new beginning. Genesis 12, 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show you, show thee. Here is a confrontation. A man, sinful, fallen, human, Greeted and confronted with the living God. There is no soft peddling. God makes his demands known. There is no softly, softly approach. But clear, direct and to the point. Abraham, get up and go. Abraham. Get up and go. This is a start of a new beginning and it starts with a call to go. We've only been introduced to Abraham in the previous chapter. We do not know a great deal about him at this point in the scriptures. Abraham was born and raised in the Ur of the Chaldees, which is in modern Iraq. And we also know from Joshua 24 2, it says that Abraham and his fathers worshipped idols. They were idolaters. They weren't worshippers of the one true God. The God who had created all things. In Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old times, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. So this call comes to Abraham from a god up to this point he did not know and did not worship. And yet God stooped down low and by his sovereign decree he chose this man, this particular man, out of the whole population of the world to communicate with. We have no inclination in the text that Abraham was seeking after this true God. No recorded prayers of Abraham. And yet God chose to confront Abraham and to call him out of his idolatry and call him to himself. If we think back upon Thursday, 
the Thursdays and, and the series that we've been looking through. We know what the true condition of man is. That they are fallen, they are rebellious, that they are dead in their trespasses and, and sins. That there is no one of us, no not one that is good before God. There is none that seek after him. Abraham was one just like that. And we also have seen uh, the truth of sovereign election, that God is the one who is in charge and chooses the undeserving and the dead to bestow life upon. We see this in Abraham. For it is God who instigated this. It wasn't Abraham somehow seeking after the true God. It's God that confronts Abraham. It is God who is the one that pursues his fallen creation. It is not Abraham but God who is the driving seat of this conversation. Just ponder for a moment how startling this would have been to Abraham. He, he knew that there was a higher power. He thought that he was worshipping that higher power in the, idol, uh, the idols. We presume that he, he worshipped the moon god. But this god never speaks, not audibly. This god never acts decisively. Because this God is a false God. And to be confronted with the true and living God, the creator and sustainer of all the world, I think that would have come as a shock to him. Do you think he would come as a shock to you? The Lord gives this command to get up and go. What would you say in such a situation? What would you be thinking? Whoa, wait on a moment. Who exactly are you? What right do you have to tell me what to do? Or the favourite question of every child across the land. Why? Yet none of this is recorded. All that we have in, the, in this record is verse 4. Abraham's response to this command to get up and go. Is Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And we'll look at that as we get down through the passage. But this is shocking. A God that you didn't know comes and speaks to you and tells you to get up and go. So let us take a few moments to think about what was asked of Abraham. As we have already thought this is no let's start off easy and see how we get along together. No, God immediately jumps in and commands and demands everything from Abraham. Just like our Lord Jesus demands everything from us. Mother, father, children, if you honour them, if you respect them, if you love them more than me, then you are not worthy of Jesus. Because you do not see him for who he is. Demands everything of Abraham. And he demands everything of us. He's not left with any other comfort, blankets and security. Get up and go and trust me for the journey. All in one sentence, God strips away all that is familiar, 
all that Abraham has known and calls Abraham to follow him. A call to go and a call to leave, to leave his country, to leave his kindred, to leave his father's house. The comfort of the familiar, the comfort of your own people, the comfort even of your family are at stake. All of these must be given up in Abraham's context because that is what God has called him to leave. And I'm sure that this was not an easy decision. Not an easy decision to make. And an even harder one to follow. Once that decision had been made. The solace. The peace. The rest. Of country and family. Must give way to a higher allegiance sounds so simple when you're sitting there and God isn't asking that from you this is the requirement of those who enter the kingdom as Jesus taught in our earlier reading Matthew 10 37 he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me and that he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me in an age where actually the most prominent idol is actually children. This is a hard saying. And yet this is what Jesus demands from us. Our whole allegiance in order that we may truly love the things that we love. Our mothers, our fathers and our children. The only way we can truly love them is by truly loving Christ. God does not give us the opportunity. He didn't give it to Abraham and he doesn't give us the, say, the opportunity to say exactly where we are. He always calls us out of our current way of life. He's done it to everyone here that has trusted in Jesus' sacrifice upon the cross for their sins. He hasn't left them saved and in exactly the same position, he has moved us away from where we once lived, as it were. Where we lived in our minds, where we lived in our hearts, shown by what we did, what we spent our time upon, what we read, what we watched on television, what we listened to on the radio. When Jesus comes into our lives, when God commands... We are not left in the same place. And if we are, have we heard his call? He moves us away from the influences that would hinder our walk with him. And sometimes this feels like a very lonely walk. He distances us from our own country and provides for us a new citizenship. Where is your allegiance? To your country? What is your country? As Christians, we're called first and foremost to be citizens of heaven, citizens of the kingdom of God, who live in and amongst this country, we abide by its rules. We live seeking to do good. We live seeking to bless others by being citizens of heaven. Where is our country? He moves us away from the people that we once rubbed shoulders with and gives us new friends. It's amazing, isn't it? I, I don't know if you found it, but the people that I hung around with before I was saved has dramatically changed. Their interests no longer interest me. Their desires and what they thought were important in life and what we needed to achieve in life have radically changed. 
No longer am I looking for peace and comfort and security in this world. Now I look to another place. And with that, not deliberately, but many of those that I hung around with, and I'm sure that each of you could say the same, those people that I have hung around with, uh, they've become distant. I may know them, I may, may still get on with them, but our lives are just so radically different. We don't think the same. We don't seek after the same things. And God has a way of doing that in our lives. And there were others whom I still get on with greatly. And, and they're friends, even though I'm believers. Why is that? I question and I pray continually. It might be for their good. So he moves us out of our country and gives us a new citizenship. He moves us away often from, from those that we used to hang around with. Kindred. The kindred spirit. And he brings us into a new set of kindred spirits. And then, on occasions, he moves us from our own families. And that distance between siblings and parents is noticeable. Perhaps we don't experience that kind of forcefulness in our own lives. But if you were a convert from Islam, you know what these verses mean. You know the pain behind these verses. For us, it all sounds so comforting. God moves us away from the bad and brings us to the good, to the blessings. All sounds so comforting and good when placed all in one sentence. Yet the reality of this distancing is often over many years and through many heartbreaks. Doesn't happen in one sentence usually in, in our lives, does it? It's an argument with a friend that leads to distancing because they refuse to hear about who Christ is and they hate you for belonging to him. They hate you for having life that they do not have. And that friendship, distance, one after another, so often. You try hard to keep hold of those friendships and yet it seems inevitable. They, they, they go. It brings pain. To move uh, from a comfortable existence in England to an uncomfortable citizenship in heaven where the ones that you used to rub shoulders with, your fellow countrymen, now look at you as bigoted and, and strange and behind the times. To be despised by your own fellow countrymen. Turn on the news. How do they portray Christians? The nutters. You, you watch a film, it's nearly always the Christians that are the nutters. And hiding underneath that facade is, is the murderer. Turn on the news. You hear how bigoted we are. How backwards we are. We should be progressive. We should throw away the, the God of the scriptures and in, enjoy the God of humanism. But I ask you, as our previous pastor was often heard asking people within the congregation, is he worth it? Is the God who has promised, the God who has called you into his family, is he worth it? Facing all of those challenges, all of those heartaches, facing up to the reality of the lostness of so many around us. 
to pass into the next life, not knowing God. All of that pain and suffering, is he worth that? Abraham's had a call to go, a call to leave, but he also has a call to follow. The end of verse 1. Unto a land that I will show thee. Get up, pack your bags, we're leaving this place. But where to? How do you answer this question when you don't even know? If it was just Abraham, perhaps it would have been easy. He could have got up, packed his bag and gone. But he's got to convince the family to to travel with him. Where are we going? Why? Are you sure you haven't lost it? God does not give Abraham the specifics. Not even a general direction. No postcode to enter into the satnav to get you roughly in the right location. Only a call to follow. The only thing that is made clear to Abraham is that where he is now is not where he is to remain. When we looked at Ruth's story, she did the same thing. She left her country, her people, and even her family. But at least she knew where she was going, the direction that she was heading to. Abraham did not have that. All that he had was an unknown God speaking and directing him to pack up and get going. To follow after him. And although it's true that God commands and that God does not always give us the roadmap of where we are going, it is also true that God knows our frame. And always sends us into the unknown with promises. God's conversation didn't stop at verse 1. You may not know where you're going. You may not know where you're heading. But follow me. Why? And God follows this with blessings. And promises. Tangible things that... Abraham can hold on to. God always sends us into the unknown with promises. For God's call was not only to go, not only to leave, not only to follow, but also a call unto blessing and to be a means of blessing. Verse 2 and 3. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. What would have happened if Abraham had just remained? Thinking about the context of these blessings, I think it's interesting to note Uh, That behind the context of these verses is the effort of man. We've had 11 chapters that precede this chapter. We see the account in the previous chapter of the Tower of Babel. One of the aspirations of the builders was to make a name for themselves. In fact, we could say that men as encountered between, I suppose, Genesis chapter 3 or 1 to 11, if you want, we see a continuous failing of mankind trying to elevate himself. The folly of human efforts to obtain wisdom. Genesis 3, 5, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Their attempt... Failed. I think failed is such a weak word. Oh, 
So he had the failing in Genesis 3, 5. Their attempt of ob- obtaining a name for themselves. The, the attempt of, uh, of producing uh, the leaders of the world. Genesis 6, 4, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old. Men of renown, men of name. Men that made something of themselves. Yet they sought it by unlawful means. And what they sought, what humanity has always sought by unlawful means, Abraham receives by divine grant. Notice where all of these blessings flow from. Not Abraham's cleverness or astuteness. Not from his efforts nor his achievements. Each and every promise of blessing in this passage is ascribed coming from the hand of none other than God himself. These verses in context indicates that the Lord, not Abraham, is the dispenser of blessing for the nations. Abraham has no exclusive claim on God's blessing. I don't think that sunk in because you're not looking shocked. Abraham has no exclusive claim on God's blessing. Rather... God has exclusive claim on Abraham and on all those who submit to Abraham's God. God doesn't owe it. He's not at the beck and call of Abraham. It's the other way round. It's God who speaks. It is God who promises. It is God who vouchsafes these promises I, I will make of thee a great nation. Just compare that to the previous chapter, verse 30. 11, verse 30. And it tells us that Sarai is barren. She can't have children. I will make of thee a great nation. Are you sure you've got the right person, God? Do you not know my circumstances? I will bless thee and make thy name great. You're not going to do it. I'm going to do it. And thou shalt be a blessing and I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Who is the source of this blessing? In one sense, we'd be tempted to say Abraham. But it's not. It's God, his promises, his word through Abraham. Let us not lose sight of the fountain of all blessings. But also notice, Abraham's not promised the Kushti time, even with the blessings Abraham can expect to encounter both those who will bless him and those who will curse him. It's clear in the passage. And the promise is equally true. That God responds. God cares for his people. And the way, as Jesus said, those that receive you receive me. The way people treat you, their eternal destinies are at stake, are at risk with the way they respond. Not because you're special, not in a human level, but because God has set his name upon you. And when we act in obedience, when we act right, then we should be bringing Jesus to others. We should be bringing the promises of God and the blessings of God to others. 
Now, you know me long and well enough to know that I'm not talking about a, a, a prosperity gospel or a social gospel. But there is an element whereby our lives ought to be glorifying God in good deeds, in kindness, in love, in the proclamation of the truth. God has promised. So the question is, what is Abraham to do with his calling? His call to go, his call to leave, his call to follow, his call to be a blessing and to be blessed. What will he do? More personally, what will you do? For in all of this there is a silent call, one that is left unspoken, a call to obedience. So Abraham, verse 4, departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abraham was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. So Abraham departed. He left everything. Did he do it rightly? He was told to leave his family. And what that means is not, not his wife, but his extended family. And yet he takes Lot with him. I wonder. Sophia? Thank you. I wonder if that's the reason that we see later on that Abraham and Lot get into so much trouble with one another. But nevertheless, Lot falls into the blessing of being with Abraham. But what are those obstacles to obedience? You know, God has stripped him of most of those obstacles, hasn't he? he he's moved him out of the comfort of, of, of life. Moved him away from the area that he knows, the people that he knows, the family that he knows. He's removed comfort from him in one sense. He's removed him from the very place of the false religion where he may be tempted to go and worship again with those that he knows. But think about his circumstances. This doesn't happen when Abraham is young. It happens when he's 75. Go. You don't know where to, but you're 75. Makes it easy to obey, doesn't it? Or does it make it more difficult? There are physical reasons here as an obstacle for obedience. And yet he goes. Well, well, you don't know my situation. You don't know the difficulties that I face day to day. And I don't. But we can always make excuses for being disobedient to what God calls us to do. And they can sound so legitimate. What would have happened if Abraham had said, I'm 75 years old. I can't do that. What would have happened? You know, thinking on a hypothetical concept, a hypothetical thought process. What if Abraham had used his situation in disbelief? I wonder if we'd be sitting here today. 
hypothetically. And yet we do it every day. We excuse ourselves from following God because of this, that and the other. Can you imagine as Abraham is following God, however the Lord directed him, and then he realises he's heading towards Canaan. This, this isn't a nice place. This isn't filled with nice people. This, this is a pretty rotten and horrible land. His wife's likely to be taken from him. He's 75. And she's still quite attractive. Desirable. These people that he's going to don't know the God of the Bible. They're abhorrent. Humanly speaking, they're abhorrent. And yet, Abraham continues. I think the greatest obstacle to obedience is unbelief, isn't it? I'm 75. I can't go there. I can't do that. My situation is such that perhaps God's got it wrong. And yet, we see in Abraham, obedience into the unknown. A willingness to trust in the promises of God. A willingness to place his faith, his whole life. It's not just mental ascent, is it? This faith, this is lived out. And that's why later on in Genesis 15, 6, we hear these words. And he believed in the Lord. And the Lord counted it to him for righteousness. We hear in the New Testament, James 2, 23. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God. And it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Interestingly, the promise to give the land to Abraham doesn't occur until verse 7. And verse 7 follows the promise to show the land. That's what God calls him to, to show you a land, to live somewhere. But the promise of giving that land to Abraham and his, to his descendants only occurs when Abraham makes the move. It's through his obedience that this is fulfilled. And God often calls us to walk in faith, by faith. Sometimes without knowing what the benefits are. And yet when we find that we've taken that first step, how often does God reward us? Not because of promise, not because he said that he was going to, he just seems to do it. We step out in faith and God responds. He is the giver of every good gift. God has given us the opportunity also for a new start this year. The God of Abraham is also the same God of today. He still calls us to go. The Great Commission Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Get up and go. Preaching, declaring the righteousness of Christ. He still calls us to leave, if necessary, to leave everything. Our jobs, our money, our family, our lives, everything. If he calls us to do so. He still calls us to follow, to follow after Christ. To see the great high priest of our calling. 
He still calls us to blessing in knowing him in the now and the blessing of eternal life in the future. He still calls us to share these blessings with others. To live as if we are in God's kingdom rather than our own. And he most definitely still calls us to obedience. God commands that every man, woman and child repent. Turn from their sins. Turn to Jesus. And put their trust and faith in him. God commands it. God has not changed. The question is, have we? Yet amidst the trials of this life, the testing of our lives, the testing of our faith, we have one more thing to see today from our passage. On our journey, God encourages us along the way. Verse 6. And Abraham passed through the land unto the place of Sychem, unto the place of Morah. And the Canaanite was there in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and high on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abraham journeyed, going on still toward the south. When Abraham entered into the land, he saw the Canaanites there. I can imagine his heart fainting. And yet God appears. God encourages him along the way. And that is the story, I believe, of every Christian who has ever been called to follow after Christ, to take up his cross, to suffer, to love. The pain is real. The hurt is real real and just when you think that you can't go on any further the Lord appears and encourages us on our way this is the God that we serve the God that does not allow you to sit in the pew to sit in your lives Ignoring him. He calls you to get up. Go. Follow him. Be obedient. Trust. <coughs> and obey. For there is no other way. To be happy in your salvation. To be happy in God. To be happy in Jesus. But to trust and obey. Rod, would you close this section in <coughs> prayer? You know, we, we thank you for these words, Lord. How you guide us at the steps, Lord. Your promises, Lord. Give us a hand to trust in your promises, Lord. You are giving to us through all your scriptures, Lord. Thank you for keeping us, Lord, to, to not stumble in this journey that we have with you. Lord. And thank you again, Lord, for you save us from perdition, from mm. hell, Lord. And uh, you will take us to that land, Lord, that the promised land that is in your kingdom. Lord. We ask you, Lord, you, your work and Coming to our hearts and minds, Lord, we can apply that in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are shortly to share in an encouragement along the way.
that we're called to share in the encouragement that God has given his church in the celebrating of the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper. It belongs to him. I want you to think seriously and truthfully. Have you followed the call? God has called you into fellowship with himself through his son. How is that call going in your life? Have you even heard the call? If you haven't, then this supper, this bread, this juice is not for you. Let it pass. If you're willing to give your friends, your family, your life, everything over to Jesus Christ, then this is for you. And by partaking... That is what you are saying. I'm yours totally. There is none other that has a claim over me. You don't need to fear God. He doesn't he will not call from you that which you cannot give. But equally we must all be willing to give everything up for the kingdom of God, for the following of Jesus Christ, taking up that cross to follow after him. <coughs> How have you responded to that call? For those of you who know Christ and yet are struggling, Lord, if you really called me to do that, would I do it? Lord, I really don't know. I don't know if I have the faith. then this is for you. The Lord's table, the Lord's supper has been given for Christians and them alone, those who follow after Christ, imperfectly as we do, to strengthen us along our way, to be reminded of what Christ gave for his church, for his people. The sacrament is only for those who are walking with the Lord Jesus Christ in discipleship. Doesn't mean that you've made it, but it does mean that you have confessed your sin to God Almighty, that you have repented, and in every fibre of your body you resist the devil, you resist the temptation to sin, even though you fail. This sacrament is for us as an encouragement along the way. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament, the new covenant in my blood, the new promise in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft, often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily. And that means not knowing Jesus, not repenting of your sins, knowing that you would not give to God anything that he asked if you thought it was too steep. Whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty 
of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. The scriptures talk about the importance of this celebration. It says that there were even people in the Corinthian church that, who died by partaking of this supper unworthily. That's why we make such a big thing of it. Because not only do we remember, but in faith we eat and we drink and we are lifted to the heavenlies to meet with God. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, And if you're not in Christ when you meet him, no good can come of that. But to us, who walk by faith, Lord, grant us sight. Let us pray. Our gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we sit at the beginning of this new year. We sit before mundane things, bread and grape juice. But we also sit before your sight. We ask, Lord, as we take these elements, the bread and the grape juice, that we may eat and drink in faith, in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ and all that he has achieved for his people. I pray, Lord, that as we chew upon the bread, we may know what our Lord gave for us and what he calls from us. To be willing to do for him. As we drink this juice Lord. Let us consider and understand what it meant for the Holy One of Israel. The Son of God in the flesh. To shed his blood on account of my sin. May we know as we eat and drink the body and blood of our Lord and may you draw us to yourself, increase our faith, comfort us along our journey. For we ask it in the name of our Lord and Saviour. Amen. took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it saying this is my body that is broken for you this do in remembrance of me <coughs> brother gave his body for you.
the same manner also he took the cup. Let us pray. Our gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blood that was shed at Calvary. Lord, the sacrifice that you demanded, the shedding of blood that took away the sin of your people, that took my sin, our sin away. We give honour and praise and glory and worship to the eternal Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. By his blood, by his stripes, we are made whole. Encourage us, Lord, to keep our eyes fixed upon him. The blood that was shed, that we, O oh God, may trust and obey. To the glory of Christ we ask. Amen. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. We praise you, Lord Jesus. Lord and Heavenly Father, now as we leave this place, we know that we go, may it be to follow you. May we know what it is to give everything up for you, to be willing to be obedient to follow you, to take up our cross and to follow after Jesus in the power of your Holy Spirit. But along the way, Lord, you know our frame, you know our constitution. Lord, even through this week, give us those little tokens to encourage us along our way. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God the Father, the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with us all forevermore. Amen.